Welcome to Sunday Worship at Beverly Hills Presbyterian Church. These are days where we feel like we need to dig deep. And the truth is resilience and perseverance are things we need right now, but resilience and perseverance apart from faith are just, it's just positive thinking. Let me share with you a text that the Apostle Paul wrote to the church in Rome. He said, we also boast in our sufferings knowing that suffering produces endurance and endurance produces character and character produces hope and hope does not disappoint us because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. Now, I'm not sure we really need to boast in our sufferings, but, but we certainly also don't need to be mastered by them. Why is that? Because we have hope. And that hope has true grounding in the love that God has for us, the love that God has shown to us in Jesus Christ and his spirit poured out upon us. So let us go through the things that we're going through right now, but let us do it with a resilience that is, that is anchored in the Holy Spirit. Let us join together now and worship and worship this God who bears us through all things. Let me share with you some announcements from the life of the church. First, let me begin by affirming to you that we will gather again to worship in this space. I know that the church is not the building, the church is the people of God, and yet the people of God are blessed to have a space to come together and worship. With that said, we need to be patient. We need to trust that God is part of this time, even this time of separation as we strengthen our faith. In the meantime, know that we are planning our, our next steps. Know that we are, we are ready and when we are ready and when we are clear to do so, we plan on gathering together and, and the first steps will likely be uh, some kind of a service outside on the patio. Know that whatever steps we take, we will also have an online component for anybody who's, who would rather stay at home and worship, knowing that um, everything we do is going to be open to everybody, every part of this congregation. But please be in prayer. Please be in prayer for your church. Please be in prayer for your city, for your country, and for the world in this time. I also want to ask you to please continue to give as you are able. I know that these are, are uncertain times for many. So giving is an act of faith, maybe more obviously in this time than any other. So I thank you for your faithfulness, even as I ask you to please continue to give. And with that, let us turn to prayer and ask Calvin to lead us in a time of prayer. Welcome everybody and glad you're with us. Would you join me now in coming before the Lord in prayer, please?
Father God, I ask for a blessing upon us today. God, I ask for the presence of the Holy Spirit, God, and the Spirit of Christ Jesus, our King, God, to be with us as we press into and ask ourselves the question of what is strength? What does it mean to be strong? God, as we are in a time of extreme tension, socially, God, politically, our country is in a state of division and derision, Lord. As election season approaches, God, we ask for your guidance. I pray, Lord, that we would be kingdom-minded people, that we would be kingdom-focused people, Lord, that that would be at the forefront of everything that we do, God, everything that we think, everything that we speak, Jesus. That as we ask, what does it mean to be a good leader, Lord? Within our own families, Lord, within our communities, Lord, nationally, God, that we would remember the example set before us by Christ our King, who was definitively the most powerful being to have ever walked this earth. That at any point he could have called forth the fire from the heavens. He could have called forth legions of holy warriors from places unseen and unknown to us. He could have called forth any manner of destruction to exemplify his power and dominion over this world and universe. Yet he did none of those things. He wandered the earth as a preacher, a healer with practically no money, practically homeless, unmarried, yet he could calm storms with a single word. He could bring to life people from the dead, yet he chose to live as a humble man humbling himself to the point of death. God, may we be so bold as to emulate Christ in any of these things while being struck with the truth that he lived that perfect, most pleasing life to you for our sake so that we do not have to, but that in that grace we get to aspire towards living that life with him, in him, with you, in you. Lord, help us to be strong in prayer, Lord. That we are strong because we are coming before you at all times, with all things, to the one who is most powerful, Lord. May we be bold in continuing to intercede and pray for our country, for equality among men and women, for justice, for this virus to stop spreading, for there to be a cure, for there to be healing for those who are sick, for there to be provision for those who are in need and wanting, Lord. Let us be bold in praying for these things, knowing that you will work through them. Lord, and let us be bold to pray in the way that your son taught us to, which is to say, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. 
For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Will you please pray with me? Lord God, we gather in the presence of the holy, the magnificent, the awesome living God. And we know that we are the, the rumbling, bumbling, stumbling sons and daughters. Um, and so we, we gather in the belief that you choose us, that you use us, that you rely upon us, that you pour yourself into us. And we ask that, we ask that these moments would be hallowed as we know your presence as you shape and form us by your word. We ask that you do this in um, Jesus' name. Amen. So let me tell you a story. Uh, many years ago, I, was, I worked as a youth pastor, and one of my students had a father who was a veteran of Desert Storm. He was a, a Green Beret, a Delta Force, some kind of special forces thing. I'd, I'd met him before. He was huge. He was, uh, he was so big, I, it was almost like I knew he could break me without breaking a sweat. Even so, after I met him, he became somewhat fixated on me. You see, despite his strength, he was, he was broken. He was a man who fled into the bottle often to escape the, the demons of war. He was incredibly gifted, though, so he always seemed to be a person who was able to find a job easily, even if he lost it pretty readily after that, anytime he needed to forget. One day, I, I got a phone call from him. And I could tell he was probably in one of those in the bottle phases, but, but he was really good at hiding it. So I wasn't, I wasn't sure. He, he just wanted to talk. It took a while of chatting before he got to the thing that he really wanted to say to me. And he, and he finally said to me, he said, Pastor Andrew, do you really believe all of this God stuff, all of this Jesus stuff? And before I even had a chance to answer, he kind of lit into me. He said, he said, cause here's the thing. This is what I think. I think that that's just, I think that's just weak. I think that's just things that, that people like you need when things get too big or too scary or too frightening for you. You just need to believe that there's something out there that loves you, that can save you. And I, and I think it's just plain weak. And I could, uh, I could hear the disdain in his voice and several waves of emotion kind of passed over me that I had to kind of process before I answered. I, I wanted to answer and say, well, well, how's this whole not Jesus thing working out for you? But I quickly realized that this guy was trained to to hunt down and kill people who are a lot harder to hunt down and kill than me. And so I thought making him angry is probably not the right thing to do. Then I wanted to just be, def I wanted to defend it. I wanted to say Christianity makes sense and I wanted to show all the reasons why it was the smart way to go. But, but instead what I did is I just kind of sat there. I sat there and after a while I just said, you know, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure that you're wrong. 
whenever I think of that story, um, two verses from the Apostle Paul kind of spring to my mind. Let me read them to you now. They come from Corinthians chapter 12, uh, verses nine through 10. Let me read them. They, Paul has, says this, he writes this, he says, but he, meaning God, said to me, my grace is sufficient for you for power is made perfect in weakness. So I will boast all the more gladly of my weakness so that the power of Christ might dwell in me. Therefore, I'm content with weakness, insults, hardship, persecutions, and calamities for the sake of Christ. For whenever I am weak, then I am strong. I, I like how that verse starts. I particularly like how that verse starts when I consider the context of that story I just told you. I like it because Jesus is saying, hey, Andrew, my grace is sufficient for you. Even if this guy can't tell the strength that is in you, my power is present in you. But then Paul keeps talking, right? He, he says things like, he describes it as weakness and insults and hardships and persecutions and calamities. It's not a great list. It's quite a few things to kind of put on our shoulders before we get to the, the place of the power of God being found in us. I mean, today we might as well add COVID-19 and murder hornets to that list just to be, just to be relevant. And you kind of hope that Paul eventually will get around to the place where he says, hey, these things happen, but don't worry, big brawny Christianity is going to come and save you. Just, just name it and claim it. But he doesn't. Instead, there's a sense that he's, he's comfortable with these things, these things like vulnerability and weakness. And it's like this sense that, that maybe in his vulnerability and weakness is actually where he finds the power of Jesus. When he is weak, then he is strong. But what does that even mean? How can you be strong when you're, when you're weak? I feel, I feel like I'm almost uh, talking myself into agreeing with that, that kid's dad all of a sudden. Let me share a story with you. Let me share a Jesus story with you. Or maybe more prop properly, we should call it a, the story of two Jesuses. You see, at the end of Jesus' life, he was the epitome of vulnerable. He was, um, the Gospel of Matthew paints the picture really well. And it paints it in a way that, that we see two guys in contrast to Jesus to make Jesus' vulnerability that much more, more present. The first guy is this guy named Pilate. The second guy we'll, we'll get to later. But let me read to you from Matthew chapter 27. I'm going to start in verse 11. We're going to, we're going to look at this Pilate guy in contrast to Jesus. It says, now Jesus stood before the governor and the governor asked him, are you the king of the Jews? Jesus said, you say so. But when he was accused by the chief priests and the elders, and he, he did not answer. Then Pilate said to him, do you not hear how many accusations they make against you? But he gave him no answer, not even, a single not even to a single charge. So the governor was greatly amazed. You see, Jesus is, the end, is at the end of the line here. All of the other religious leaders in Jerusalem are, are kind of tired of him and so tired of him, they kind of want him dead. He's a He's a blasphemer as far as they're concerned. He's somebody who's, who's talking about God in ways that they don't agree with and they're, they're just tired of him. But they don't have all the power. They have a lot of power, but not all the power. And so they, they have to take Jesus and take him to the person who has all of the power. And Pilate is this guy who's the, the Roman governor over Jerusalem. He's the guy in charge. He, he didn't have all the power either, but he had the power to put Jesus to death if he wanted to. Uh, he could put him to death as a traitor to Rome. And that was the charge against him. He was, he was calling himself king of the Jews. Now, in our text, we get Pilate as most arrogantly powerful. You could tell he's kind of annoyed by the whole argument. This peasant preacher versus these religious leaders, he had other things to do. And so he, he turns to Jesus and he says, I mean, are what they're saying about, is what they're saying about you, is it, is it true? Are you really a king? And you get the sense that he, he looks Jesus up and down at this point, much like that, that military guy looked me up and down the first time he, he saw me. And he kind of thought, you don't look very kingly. You look more weak to me. And Jesus very enigmatically says to him, in a way, but probably not the way that you're thinking of. Now, this is when the religious leaders, they kind of jump in and they start to, to talk and to accuse him. And uh, what's the word from 2 Corinthians? They, they insulted Jesus. And, and when listening, you almost get this sense that, that they're not trying to, they're not trying to get Pilate to know the truth. They're trying to almost politically persuade Pilate to the answer they want him to find. And, and it's here that we realize that, that Pilate may be tough, but he doesn't have all of the power. And that's, that's the problem with power, isn't it? Unless you have all of the power, it's still a game. Because like having a second or third amount of most power is kind of a dangerous place to be. And if, and if you're the first most powerful person, if the second and third gather up against you, again, it's a dangerous place to be. You see, power almost always demands politics, constant politics. So, so said another way, or maybe looked at another way, Pilate is most interested here in not being vulnerable. The religious leaders are most interested here in not being vulnerable. 
The only person who's not interested in avoiding vulnerability is Jesus. And he's the most vulnerable person in the narrative. I mean, does he even realize how vulnerable he is at this point? And so Pilate asks him, do you even realize how vulnerable you are at this point? And Jesus remains silent. He just sits there. He doesn't, he doesn't answer. If he's appealing to a power to, to kind of protect him in his vulnerable estate, that power is not, is not politics. It's not, it's not Pilate. It's here that Pilate makes a kind of a power move. He, uh, he makes a power move that, that in essence introduces us to the second power character that I want to hold up in contrast of Jesus in this point. Let me read to you from Matthew 27, verses 15 to 23. It says, now at the festival, the governor was accustomed to release a prisoner for the crowd, anyone whom they wanted. At that time, there was a notorious prisoner called Jesus Barabbas. So after they had gathered, Pilate said to them, whom do you want me to release for you? Jesus Barabbas or Jesus who is called the Messiah? For he realized that it was out of jealousy that they'd handed him over. And while he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent word to him, have nothing to do with that innocent man. For today, I have suffered a great deal because of a dream about him. Now the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowds to ask for Barabbas and to have Jesus killed. The governor again said to them, which of the two do you want me to release to you? And they said, Barabbas. Pilate said to them, then what should I do with Jesus who is called the Messiah? All of them said, let him be crucified. Then he asked, why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, let him be crucified. In this text, Pilate overplays his hands, right? Keep his mind, keep in mind his actions on Jesus' behalf aren't because he's a Christian. It's not because he really cares about Jesus all that much. He's, he's really just didn't want to get his political opponents to have an upper hand over him. And so, so what he did is he appeals to the crowd, hoping the crowd will agree with him and, and he'll win this political contest. And in doing so, he introduces us to the second person or passage again, that a power person I want you to, to hold up in contrast to Jesus. Now, ironically, his name is Jesus too. And maybe even more ironically, his, his full name is Jesus Barabbas. In Hebrew, the word bar means son. The word Abba means father. So his real name is Jesus, son of the father. And so here, Pilate presents these two Jesus, son of the fathers, and puts them in front of the crowd. And he says, he says, you decide what to do. Who should we kill? Who should we crucify? And who should we allow to live? Now, even if their names are the same, these two Jesus are very different. Jesus Barabbas is somebody who is a known kind of criminal or revolutionary. Most likely he killed a Roman soldier to some degree, either in a crime or in an attempt to kind of throw the yoke of the Roman empire off of the Jewish people. Jesus, the Messiah was different. He was a, he was a preacher and he preached peace. He said, pay your taxes. He said, if they force you to walk a mile, go a second. He says, pray for your enemies. You see one Jesus decided to respond to the world with power and with strength, even if he lost a few rounds. The other Jesus, he was vulnerable. Now, maybe it's it's not all that surprising to know that the crowd chose Barabbas instead of Jesus Christ. Now, let me see if I can help you understand what Jesus is doing here. And it'll become even more important when you realize the apostle Paul thinks that that we need to be like Jesus, that that we need to, um, we need to be more like Jesus Christ than Jesus Barabbas. Let me read you a text from uh, the letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to the church in Philippi. This is from Philippians chapter two. I'm gonna read to you verses five through eight. He says, let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but he emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being found in human likeness and being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. I want you to notice two things in this text. I want you, first thing I want you to notice is the way that Paul begins it. He says, let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. And so right off, we know that he's gonna tell us a little bit about the character of Jesus Christ. And that's what this is about, but it's also more. It's also an invitation, an invitation for us to, to choose the way of Jesus, to choose the way of vulnerability over the way of power. The second thing I want you to notice is is the way that this text in some ways almost plots like a graph that goes down. It begins by revealing who Jesus was before the incarnation, before he was born in a manger. He was was in the form of God. He was like God. He was in the most powerful place that anybody could possibly be in. And that was Jesus. And even though that's who he was, he didn't think that, that, that politics or exploiting or grasping that power was the way he was supposed to go. And so instead he, he emptied himself. He humbled himself. 
He, he chose this trajectory of vulnerability. He begins at the highest place a person can possibly be, that Jesus could possibly be, and he moves into a place of, of becoming like a human, like a slave, into Matthew 27, where, where Barabbas and Pilate are, are kind of humiliating him into this place of the cross and into the grave. Now, why? Why would Jesus do this? Why would Jesus choose this course of vulnerability? It doesn't say it in this text, but scripture is pretty clear that there's roughly two reasons. I'm sure there's more, but two that I'll share with you right now. The first is he did it to save us. You see, he couldn't save us from heaven. He had to come and be like us. He had to come so th- be like us so that he could take our sins upon himself. We call that substitutionary uh, atonement. And in order to put himself in a position to do this, he had to become vulnerable, vulnerable to the point of death on the cross. Now, the second reason is the one I want us to kind of focus on today because I think uh, the implications for discipleship are powerful. You see, the, the second reason Jesus emptied himself is so that he could, so that he could know us. He became like us so that he could understand us and we could understand him. He, he did it to connect with us. And that's also the reason that he went as low as he did so that we would always know, no matter how far we fall, that Jesus empties himself further still. That he goes as far as death on a cross to let us know that, that he wants to connect with us. He wants to be with us. Let me, let me see if I can illustrate that with a, a rather silly story. The other morning, um, I was, I was praying. And I know that sounds good and Christian-y, but let me give you the context. I was, I was praying and, and it was a notable morning to pray because the day before I had, I'd spent the afternoon ignoring God. You see, that's, that's one of my temptations. And maybe because I work in the church, I don't know, but it's one of my temptations. When things get, when things get heavy or tiring or, or, or overbearing, I, I just want to check out and I want to ignore everything. And, and that includes ignoring God. And so that morning when I was praying, I'd, I was praying in a, a way to reconnect, reconnecting, knowing that I was the one who had disconnected. I, I assume that I now understand what it's like for a dog who runs out of the house and rolls in the mud and, and then comes home with its tail between its legs. But, but I was praying. And as I was praying, I prayed in one of the ways I, I typically do. I have this, this habit of taking the, uh, the spiritual, um, uh, the fruit of the spirit and kind of praying through them and and kind of meditating and thinking on the character of God and asking God to, to form that character in me by, by bearing the fruit of the Spirit in me. And as I, was, as I was kind of praying through the fruit of the Spirit and asking God to bless me, it, I had a moment where I thought, why would God do this for me? I mean, I had just spent the, the afternoon and the day before ignoring God. Why would, he, why would he want to have anything to do with me? Much less, why would he want to, to bless me? And you know the answer to that question, right? It's Matthew 27. It's Philippians chapter two. It's because Jesus made himself vulnerable. Jesus made himself vulnerable to the point of the cross and the grave and never once said, enough, you've pushed me too far. Hear that for yourself. Whatever you have done, wherever you have gone, gone, Jesus does not say to you, enough, you have pushed me too far. Whatever you think disqualifies you, whatever you think you've done that displeases Jesus, Meet him where he actually is. Meet him in his vulnerability. The good news is that's actually not where the Philippians text ends. Let me read to you the, the second half of this text, verses nine through 11. There's a, there's a kind of an upward trajectory. So the, the graph goes back up. He says, therefore God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name so that the name of Jesus, every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God, the father. Do you hear that? You see, power is ultimately enacted on Jesus's behalf and it's not the power of the crowd. It's not the power of Pilate. It's not even Jesus' own wit and sarcasm and ability to get out of a situation. No, it says that God exalted him. God raised Jesus from the dead. We know in Ephesians that God places him in the heavenlies. And, but this Philippians text, it doesn't talk about any of that. Instead, it focuses relationally. Jesus is raised so that he might stay in relationship, in power, but in relationship with everybody. Every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess. That's what this text in Philippians is kind of pointing to us. Power made perfect in weakness. So let me try to reiterate something, something I think is, a, is the point I want from this sermon more than anything. This vulnerability is, 
It isn't just something that Jesus has done on our behalf. This vulnerability is something that Jesus invites us into. You see, this summer, we've been talking about discipleship. We've been talking about some of the the basics of being friends and followers of Jesus Christ. And and one of the basics that we never really ever think of as being a basic is is vulnerability. And we don't talk about it much because we Christians, we we don't like vulnerability. We're like everyone else. But frankly, it's in our vulnerability that we connect with Jesus. You see, in those moments when we we move in power, we think that we're strong. There's no way we're ever gonna look to a, to a guy on a cross to take our brokenness from us. There's no way we're gonna look to our weaknesses to see where Jesus is moving in the midst of it so we might discover his power. No, frankly, it is in our vulnerability that we connect with other people, either in testimony or in sharing this, this gospel journey with them. If we, don't, if we don't share our burdens, we'll never bear one another's burdens. And frankly, it's in our vulnerability that we discover the power of God. And that's important. It's worth noting because we Christians for centuries, we've gotten really used to moving in power. We, we flex our political muscles. We flex our economic muscles. We flex our military muscles. And sometimes we, sometimes we look more like Pilate than we do like Jesus. Let me circle back to this conversation I had with this Green Beret Special Forces guy. So I'd realized that he was right that I am weak. But I also realized that he was weak too. And that it was his reliance upon his strength that was keeping him from from connecting with Jesus. It is his reliance upon his strength that was keeping him from connecting with me as a friend on this path. And so I chose, I chose vulnerability. I said to him, you're right, I'm weak. I don't think I can do this without Jesus. You see, there's too much in life, there's too much in death that is, that is too much for me to handle. And, and if it weren't for Jesus, I'd be plowed under by the things that I see, by the things that I've seen, by the things that I've done, by the things that have been done to me. But it's because of Jesus that I'm not. Jesus that I know that I don't have to do it alone. It's because of Jesus that I that I know that he walks with me through difficult times. It's because of Jesus, I know that I'm loved even when I'm not all that lovable. I am weak, but he is strong for me. And then I invited him into vulnerability with me, vulnerability with Christ. I said, well, how are you doing? How are you bearing the burdens that you're, that you're having to wrestle with? And I honestly think it's that question that I want to to end this sermon with. How are you doing? How are you bearing the burdens that you're forced to wrestle with? How are you coping with your vulnerability? It is precisely in our vulnerability that that Jesus meets us. This is the not often talked about truth about discipleship. It is precisely in our vulnerability that we, that we connect with other people on this gospel path. It is precisely in this vulnerability that we discover the power of God made perfect in us. Will you meet Jesus in your vulnerability today? Pray with me. Lord Jesus, truly it is in our brokenness that you are made known. Scripture tells us that that is this truth that is held in, in clay jars and we are, we are filled with the fullness of God and yet, Jesus, we are broken vessels and in you, our brokenness is how you are made known. In you, our brokenness is how we discover that we are more than just ourselves, that we are sons and daughters of God and so, Jesus, we confess the ways that we run from vulnerability. We confess the ways that we run from weakness. We confess the ways that we puff ourselves up and we move in veneers and we push and we pull and we pretend. Jesus, give us authenticity. Give us vulnerability to you. And that way, help us to discover the fullness of who you are for us. And then Jesus, show us how to walk, to walk as sons and daughters of God, broken in the midst of a world that is broken too. We pray this in Christ's holy name. Amen.
seated above, throne in the Father's love. Destined to die, poured out for all mankind. God's only Son, perfect and spotless one. Never sin suffered as if he did. All oh, the
Go in peace. Go in peace knowing that as you are in your strengths, in your weaknesses, in your brokenness, in your joy, God walks with you. Lean into him. Trust him. Know that he has plans and purposes for you and walk in the peace of that relationship. Go in peace. Amen.